We're studying the message of grace. We're studying the whole book of Romans, and we're going to finish up with chapter 3. So I want to start in verse 21, okay? We talked about how every mouth is shut when you're under the law. That means you have no excuse for what you've done. And so now we get to understand what Christ did for us. Verse 21 says, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without. Now, in some versions, it'll say apart in the King James Version. In the New American Standard, it'll say apart. But it says without keeping the requirements. That does say that, right? But now the righteousness, not our righteousness, but God's righteousness, his goodness, his kindness, his mercy, his grace. But now the righteousness of God has been made clearly, clearly. That means there's no confusion. That means I, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. That means it's, it's in focus, right? Because these are near sights, so I have to take these out. It's very important that it's not only clearly, but it's revealed clearly. I ain't making this up, right? Okay, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. What that means is the prophets and the law prophesied that Jesus would come. What did they prophesy that Jesus would come? He would come to bring what? Salvation. What is salvation? Salvation is the message of grace. Salvation is the gift of righteousness. Salvation is what makes us right with God. And so what he says is that now God, not Mike, not Paul, but God. God, the same God that is the God of, the, of all the world, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning, Yahweh, Elohim, Jehovah, God, not Jesus, not the Holy Spirit, God, not Muhammad, not the Quran, God has shown us. So when you start to receive this message of grace, you've got to understand it's coming from God. So God has shown us a way to be made what? Right with him without keeping the requirements of the law that God gave Moses. I have to set this foundation for us old school bondage people. Because you need to understand that we are reading the Bible that's been in here for 2,000 years and we just ain't never read this part. And it says that was promised. The grace ain't new. Grace was part of God's plan from the beginning. You know why it blows your way that it's new? Because ain't nobody preached it. But there's one person. Matter of fact, there's 12 people that preached it 2,000 years ago. They're called the disciples. Those guys that had sandals, they didn't have no mega churches. They didn't have a lineage yet. They didn't have a car. They didn't even have air conditioning. They didn't have none of the comforts. Those guys preached the message of Christ. What are we doing in the church? My God, my God, I will never preach the stuff that I preach because I went back through my sermons and there's a lot of good sermons, but I'm just gonna add the message of grace to it because it is the word of God, but I won't preach it to condemn you. I'll preach it to free you. He said that justifying by faith in Christ was for all men. And I love that it Another says, version says, apart from the law of righteousness, God has been revealed. He's been made manifest. The word apart, I love this word apart. So God wants us to keep our distance apart from the law. So what role should the Jewish religion play in your life? You should be apart from the Jewish religion. Are you Jewish? Because if you are, then you celebrate those things because it's your heritage. But if you're a Gentile, if you're a Christian, you have no business celebrating the law. Because guess what? The law was never given to you. You were without a law. The law was only given to God's people, the Jewish people. So you got these Christians that uh, I'm this and I'm that and I got to observe this and I got to do the Passover and I got to do Hanukkah and I got to do all these things. You're not Jewish. So every time you say I accept Christ, but I'm going to do the law, what you're doing is you're disrespecting both. And I'm going to explain all that. That's why you have to stay for the whole series. 
because you'll just run with this one little thing. Listen, apart means to separate by distance from each other in time and in space. So the Bible says apart from the law. We Gentiles are supposed to be apart from the law. Now the Jews should be also apart from the law, but they don't want to accept Christ. So only the Jews that accept Christ are now partakers of grace. But those that didn't, what did they do? They killed Jesus. Who came to bring what? Salvation. Because they didn't want to be apart from the law. So let's go to 22. 22 says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes no matter who you are. In other words, one of the versions says there's no distinction. God doesn't care if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. You see, the Jews, they had to be circumcised to show that they were in the law, to show that they belonged to God. And Paul, throughout all of Romans 1 and 2, I already combated that, I already went through that. He talked about there's no difference in circumcision and uncircumcision. You must be circumcised in your heart. Remember, if you break one of the 613 rules of God, guess what? James says you break them all. So this is why God had to bring grace, because we cannot live perfect, because we're not perfect, but the law is perfect and holy. God doesn't care if you're circumcised. He doesn't care about the color or your status quo. He doesn't care about your education. He doesn't care about your income. He doesn't care about anything. That's what's so beautiful about grace. It's no respect of person. And that's what the Bible says, that God is no respect of person. If he can use an animal to speak to a prophet, surely he will use whatever he has to. People will tell you all kinds of things that you got to be in this church. You got to be baptized in these waters. You got to go dressed up. You got to go got to do, you got to do, you got to be, you got to do this, you got to wear that, you can't look like this, you can't do like this, you got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, to receive God. You got to be like me, like Mike. You got to pray like me, you got to walk like me, you got to talk like me. So many Christians are messed up today because they're trying to pray like their pastor. They're trying to mimic. I got these little kids on YouTube, on Facebook, and they quoting and mocking the pastor. <laughs> and I say, <laughs> shut up, little kid. And shame on you, parents. They can ask cute. That boy and that girl has no understanding of what it is in God. They're just mocking and repeating a pastor that they go to church since they was little and they memorized it. God does not think that's cute. You show me a baby that can speak their own word of God out of his mouth, not a mimic or a copy. Then I say, hallelujah, that baby's anointed. We are already starting to do the same thing that was taught to us. We're already falling into the pit of the law because they told us this is how we should do it. And this is what the cycle creates. It creates years and years of bondage, years and years of guilt, years and years of condemnation, years and years of confusion, years and years of you thinking you're not worthy of God. And I'm telling you because it did it to me. And at 55, God set me free. And I loved the Lord all my life. Even when I was a hellion, I still respected God. God is no distinction of person. And why is that? Because we get to 23. For everyone has sin. Everybody say it together. Everyone has sin. Paul, Moses, get in. Little coward. <laughs> I can't go fight him, God. I'm scared. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. What is God's glorious standard, guys? It's the 613 Mosaic Law. That is the standard of gold. That is the standard that if you are perfect, God will justly reward you with heaven. 
But if you're not perfect and you're the breaker of one law, you talk back to your dad one time, you say no to your mom one time, you say I don't want to do it one time, you are destroyed and you are murdered and that is the end of your life under God's glorious standard. Thank God for grace. In verse 24, it says this, Yet God... With undeserved kindness declares, now listen to this and get this in you if you don't get nothing, that we are righteous and he did it through Jesus Christ who freed us from the penalty for our sins. Grace freely makes us right with God in his sight. See, Christ paid the debt. See, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin, why does it use wage? It says the wages of sin is death. The cost, sin costs a lot, don't it? It feels good when we're doing it. I know I, I, I'm the worst of all. I, I got to admit, I, I enjoyed every one of my sins. Why I was in sin. Why I thought about sin. Why I rejected grace. Why I didn't want nothing to do with Christ. Why I embraced the world. Why I hated God. Because see, what I tell you is this. The more you fall in love with Jesus, the less you want the things of the world. And then when you enjoy sin, it's because you want the things of the world. Let's just not lie about it. Be truthful about it. There are some sins that feel so good. Feel good when I pulled the baddest chick on the block and slayed her. All my boys gave me props. Dude, you a bad dude, man. You got, you got your quack quack? Hey, brother, I had to work hard. I mean, dude, I had to buy flowers. I had to take her down, 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 Perry. Yeah. Shoo. Sex ain't cheap. It costs a lot. It costs so much nowadays, it'll cost you your life. Can you say H I V? Oh, but it felt good, didn't it? That's why the Bible says, for we all have sinned and you enjoyed your sin. But with grace, I don't have to tell you about your sin. I have to tell you about your faith. I had to tell you that you get this for free. That you don't have to work for it. That you don't have to serve for it. You just have to accept it. And then guess what happens, the beauty of it. Pastor Mike ain't got to tell you the do's and don'ts because you already know because the spirit of God goes inside of you. And God says, I will put my law inside of you. That's why salvation came. It is the spiritual law that God puts inside of you that guides you to please God. Not your mama telling you, not the pastor telling you. It says... In verse 25, for God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. God presented Jesus as appropriation. Appropriation is a big Bible word, but let me tell you what the sacrifice of Jesus is. If you read it in all the other versions, they will have the word appropriation. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are, listen to this. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God is being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in past times. For God presented Jesus as appropriation. God allowed Jesus to be displayed. Appropriation means God is pleased, God is appeased. And what God did is God looked at the public display of Christ. He's crucified. He's hanging there. He's beamed. He We've poked his sides. We've disfigured his face. He's dying. He is the one atonement. He is the blood sacrifice. No longer did God want the blood of bulls and goats. No longer did he want the burnt offerings. He said, I need a sacrifice once and for all. And he sent his son, his only son, his, o his only son son that he ever had and he sent his only begotten son to die for us and as God showed him on the cross bloody and kneeling he said look this is my son that I appropriated for you 
I have witnesses. Look, it's a public display. Have you seen it? Here it is. Forgiveness. Here it is. Atonement. Here it is. Salvation. Here it is. My gift of righteousness. Here it is. The healing and the connection to bring you back to me. Here it is, my covenant with you. Here it is, the New Testament. And he appropriated Christ. And he says, and here is the resurrection and life offer. Totally, 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 totally free. And God says, I am 100% satisfied with what my son did but I am horrified 100% by what you've done so which beloved are you going to go with are you going to go with what you've done or are you going to go with what Jesus has done if you go with what Jesus has done then you get 100% on the exam you get to have every sin that you've ever committed washed away. You get to have condemnation of your life taken away. You get to have grace for your past sins and grace for your sins that you haven't even done yet. So shall we just go on sinning? God forbid. But if we sin, is there grace? Yes. Will Jesus run out of grace for my life? No, you can never exhaust the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, then how am I changed? Oh, it's coming. Jesus' sacrifice was for all humans. Verse 26, it says, For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in the presence. Those saints that's been waiting for the promises of God in the Old Testament and they never got to see it. They got to see it when Christ brought grace. When he brought salvation, it was for those that had already passed and for those that are present. And that's why the Bible says this in verse 26. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, his goodness, his kindness. See, it is the kindness and the goodness of God that brings you to him. It is his kindness it is goodness that brings you to him. If someone is mean and nasty, are you going to join their team of the mean and nasties? But if someone is kind... It says a kind spoken word breaketh the wrath of an angry king. I want you to try something, kids and grown-ups and parents and husbands and wives. When you're having an argument, because you think you're right. I'm right in all my arguments. This is what God did. He showed kindness to your disrespect. He showed kindness to your willful disobedience. Mm-hmm. He showed kindness to you rejecting his love. Oh, Lord. And what did he do? You said, how can I hate someone like that? So husbands and wives, the next time we're in an argument or a disagreement, try to show some kindness in that moment and watch what happens. Now, it's not kindness after you didn't already made her mad and y'all didn't separate it. And then you go back, but baby, I'm, I'm sorry. That don't work. No, 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 the moment has passed. In the heat of the argument. And it says here, God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, his goodness, for he himself is fair and just. Sometimes we're not fair and just at all, huh? And he declares, listen to this, and he declares sinners. To be right in his sight, in his view. He's looking right at you. He's saying, you are right in my sight. But you're saying, God, I'm unworthy to be right in your sight. I'm the worst of the worst. I've done, I even had a problem yesterday. When they work in Christ? No. When they do all these good deeds in Christ? Feed the poor, missionary trips? No. When they talk about how good they are in Christ, love does not boast. Well, how we may write in God's sight, 
oh no, I, I just, this, this can't be true. When they believe in Jesus, O-M-G. Mom, maybe I didn't need to read it on this side. Maybe it was a, declare a sinner to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. When they believe in Jesus, how, how, how could that be true? How does God declare a sinner right? Well, remember I told you I was going to get to how, how you get right with God? Hey, I, you thought I was going to have you do some push-ups and say, Our Father who art in heaven, and confess all your sins, and I tell you all your sins are resolved. Go, son, and sin no more. Oh, and give me some money, too. Because for me to relieve your sins, it costs money. Didn't I just read you that the wages of sins is death? But then I didn't read you the rest, huh? It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The gift that is free. You see how sin costs and grace is free? Yes. Christ provided God to be fully satisfied against his righteous anger against humans. Verse 26, how do I get right with God then? The craziest way of all. But, 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 but I've been told all my life that I got to do this and I got to do that and I got to wear this clothes and I got to talk this way and I got to walk this way and I, I got to be above reproach and I, I got to be holy even though the pastor ain't holy because he's sleeping with the bookkeeper. But he going to tell me to be holy. He going to preach this fire out of this pulpit all day long and crush the hell out of me. It's the crazy thing. There's nothing you can do to get right with God. There's nothing you can do to get right with God. It's all about what you believe. And when I say do, I'm talking about an action. I'm talking about you got to come down this aisle. Everybody that raised your hand, well, come on up. Because we say, God says, if you're afraid of me, I'll be afraid of you. That has nothing to do with grace. But this is what we do. This is the law. So, so everybody wants Jesus. I want you to come on up. God says, let every man and woman work out their own salvation with the fear of truth. It's nobody's business if you didn't ask God to forgive you of your sins. Amen. Go ahead. Tell it. We do that to control. We do that because that's the law. We do that to show thyself. Be accountable. Stand up. Do you know that the sinner's prayer is not even in the Bible? You don't have to. Pray a certain way. Repeat after me. Why don't you pray your own prayer? Why don't I just preach grace? And why don't you accept it? And you pray your prayer. But the law says I got to help you. You got to do it this way. Or you ain't saved. Well, what does that say? They lied to me all my life. I'm taking vengeance against the law now. But don't get me wrong, I love the law. And I'm going to explain. We got to get to verse 31. You're going to see. And you're going to love this ending. Trust me. The part that the Holy Spirit wants you to hear, you will hear. The rest of it is Charlie Brown school teacher. Wow, 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 wow. What did he say? God does use prayer, though. It's how we communicate. It's his main tool of worship. But how do we receive God's spirit? How do we receive this? Listen, by one way. Faith comes by hearing, hearing, hearing the, the word of God, which is the good news. And when you hear the word, a sinner will be made right in God's sight when they believe in Jesus by hearing a message of grace that Jesus is. That's how you get faith. That's how you get right with God. There's no altars in the New Testament Oh, but we've made tabernacles. Preachers preach way up high to look down at all y'all. They got seven foot tall stages and you come and you just feel so proud. Forgive me, Father, preacher, man. I've sinned. 
Yes, you've done a good job convicting me of my sins. I'm ready to say the Lord's Prayer, the sinner's prayer. I mean, the prayer that's not in the Bible. I mean, what, what, what do I got to do, man? Come on. And then you go through this fake facade, and then you walk with, hey, am I saved? And then I tell you, the devil's going to come and tell you that you're not saved. You're going to feel that way because you spoke those words and you repeated that to me. But they weren't your words. They were my words. So, you know, you're going to walk out of there. And as soon as you walk out of there, you're going to feel like you ain't said. I've said that to so many people. Shame on you, Mike. But if it was your heart in that moment and your words in that moment, it would mean something more, wouldn't it? Exactly. What I love about the New Testament, you can't find an altar in the New Testament. There's only a cross, a cross, and it has replaced all the altars. Verse 27, can we boast? If this is how faith comes, can you boast that you have all this great faith? It says, can we boast that we've done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal was not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. Verse 28. So we are made right with God through faith, not by obeying the law. Paul says that you can't even boast that you have got this great message of grace because you haven't done anything to be accepted by God. See, nobody can claim grace because it's free. Grace is unmerited favor. That means you don't deserve it. You're acquittal. That means I found you not guilty. I acquitted you of all your sins by nothing you have done. And it wasn't based that you were holy and righteous and you upheld all 613 laws. But it was because of this. Guess what I'm giving y'all? No, I didn't. I didn't give you mustard seed. What did Pastor Mike just give you? Very good. Look at your faith. Look at it. Hold it. Look at this. Swallow it. You see, we can't brag about how much we believe. People are always saying, well, I don't have enough faith to believe in God. I don't have enough faith to accept this word. I don't have enough faith to believe for my new job. I don't have enough faith to, to believe for my promotion. I, I don't have enough faith that I'm going to pass school in good, good grace. I don't have enough faith that I'm going to cut it and make the team. I, I, I don't have enough faith for my heartbreak. I don't have enough faith for my emotions. I don't have enough faith to make it through this day. I don't have enough faith to get through this test and trial that I'm going through because God knows I can only take so much. I don't have faith. God. I need more faith. Where am I going to get faith from? I need faith, faith, faith. I need faith to believe this message of grace because I've been condemnation all my life. And it's hard for me to accept this. It's hard because I need faith. Jesus says that you only need faith. So guess what he says? He says you only need faith this size. I know all of you in here, you faithless beings. Yes, I've been blessed with the gift of faith. It is a gift. But that's to work miracles, but not a gift to receive grace. That's just basic faith. And Jesus says, for basic faith, you just need this much of it to believe in my message of grace. He told the disciples, this is all you need in me. You don't need nothing bigger than this. So what do we need to do when you're having those problems in school, when you're struggling in life? You need to take this flay, right? And you need to flick it in your problems direction. Flick it at that discouragement. Flick it at that disbelief. You need to put this where it needs to be. Not on the shelf and I'm going to take it out when I have a problem. Jesus, where are you? I believe now. Oh, well, well, I've always been here, but uh, I guess you didn't need me when everything was right, huh? And so Jesus said, here's some mustard seeds. Faith. I'm preaching my butt off to make sure that you understand that to receive this message of grace, you just need something this. I can't even. It's so tiny. So verse 28 says, so we are made right with God through faith. 
The size of a mustard seed? Now faith means something now, right? You see, it ain't this big scary word, is it? And not by obeying the law. Verse 29. After all, is God the God of the Jews only? No. Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? Of course he is. Verse 30. There is only one God, and he makes people right with himself only by faith. Whether they are circumcised or uncircumcised. Well then, what about the law, Pastor Mike? You've been chotty chopping the law for the last four weeks. Give me some of that condemnation. Give me some of my old church. Give me some of that old time religion. Don't you want relationship? No, I want religion. Because the religion tells me what I gotta do all the time. Religion tells me I gotta work. So then, well, 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 then, if we emphasize faith, all this great faith, the must see faith, little faith, faith for my problems, faith for grace, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. Hold on, hold on, let me, let me just clarify this. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly Fulfill the law. So, if I choose faith, what am I saying about the law? I have established in my mind that it is holy. The law is holy. It is perfect. It is perfect. It is good. It is good. But it's impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible. Oh, but I want to pick the, the three, the five, the six, the seven. No, no, you got to pick all 613. You can't pick three, five, six of the laws that you're going to. You can't pick two of the commandments of the ten that you're going to obey. If you break one, you break it all. So the law is good. The law is just. The law is holy. But the law is impossible. And if I choose faith, by choosing faith, the way of free grace the way of free forgiveness that doesn't cost me anything, it costs Jesus everything, I'm saying I can't do the other way. I'm saying, God, I, I can't live perfect. So I'll accept the gift of righteousness that makes me right with you. I'll accept it. So how does the law work? It works this way. The law convicts us of our sins and the only way we can be convicted of our sins is if we believe in God because we want to please God and so when we find out that we're trying to please you God and I broke one of the 613 here's my offering oh I still feel guilty oh I still feel condemned I come back year after year with a goat and a sheep and a bull and I sacrifice for my adultery I sacrifice for my murder I, I sacrifice for my stealing and I sacrifice for my disobedience I feel so convicted but I'm only convicted because I believe in you because I believe in the God Almighty and so I'm walking the law and I have faith in you but now what happens is that same belief that same conviction makes you that draws you to want to do right draws you to believe in grace God's new covenant amplified do we nullify the law by this faith making the law of no effect overthrowing it certainly not on the contrary we confirm and establish and uphold the law since it convicts us of sin, pointing us to the need of salvation. Stand up. Christ is the fulfillment of the law. The whole message of grace is not that the law should go away. It's no longer validated because the new law, the new covenant took its place. And when you understand that grace doesn't take away the law, it fulfills the law. Therefore, it moves on to the new covenant. That's why you have an Old Testament and that's why you have a New Testament. That's why you have the old covenant 
and you have the new covenant. What did God say in Hebrews 10? He says no longer. When Jesus came, he says you prepare a body for me because you no longer wanted the blood of goats and, and bulls and sacrifice. Because year after year, they could never take away the guilt of your sin. And so he says, so Father, on the night that I'm coming, I will come and I will do your will. Not my will, but your will. And then God declared this in heaven. He says, and this shall be the new covenant that I will put my law inside of my people's heart. So when you receive grace, when you receive salvation, it comes with that added extra strength that breaks the condemnation and the curse of sin over your life. And you're free. And guess what? When you fall down, you get back up and you're still feeling free. You're not feeling unworthy. So you don't stop coming to church. What happens is this. You fall in love with Jesus. And the Spirit of God lives in you. And it just tells you in a gentle way, that's not who you are. It doesn't say, KC, you're going to hell. But no, it says, KC, do you love me? And you say, yeah, God. He says, come on, follow me then. That's it. And then guess what happens? You fall in love with Jesus because it started with that little seed that I gave you. And you believe that you have been set free. You believe that you're redeemed. You believe that all condemnation and lies spoken of your life, God redeems you. And whom the Son is set free is free indeed. And I'll say it like I say it every Sunday. Don't let nobody put you back in that condemnation box. Is there enough grace if I sin? Yes. Shall I keep on sinning? No. Well, how do I stop sinning? How do I stop sinning? You keep working at it until old things pass away and all things are new. So everything you do after that moment of salvation is because you love them. Not because I'm telling you to do it. Because you can do and work and you won't make it to heaven. Because you don't have to do and work to receive eternal life. You have to believe. Father, I just thank you. Father, just let your word just touch every heart in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, give me affirmation. Holy Spirit, Confirm to the hearts of the believers that this word is true. We're just reading the Bible. We're just reading your word. So, Father, let them leave with hope in their hearts, with that mustard seed in their pocket. Father, I pray that they would guard that mustard seed all the days of their life because I know they've never been in a church where the pastor gave them a mustard seed. But I'm giving them faith. And I want them to remember that when they're 20, when they're 30, when they're 50, when they're 60. I want them to hold on to that seed for every trial and tribulation that they shall go through. I want them to hold on to that seed for every temptation that will come across their life. I want them to hold on to that seed Believing that I don't need great faith. I don't need big faith. I just need faith for my circumstance right now. And I want that seed to remind them of the message of grace. In Jesus' name, amen.